Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at your conference. Very sorry that we couldn't do this in person, but I'm honored to be able to talk about using machine learning to develop clinical decision support tools and rehabilitation. This is something that I've been working on in my own research program for almost a decade now. Um, and I'm happy to share some of the experience that we've had, some of the, uh, the positive findings, some of the challenges that we've experienced. But I do want to disclose that I am not a machine learning scientist. I'm a healthcare researcher. I'm a rehabilitation scientist um, that kind of acknowledges and sees the value in machine learning. I do think that it's, uh, it holds tremendous potential for improving the decisions that we make as healthcare providers. But uh, I'm, I'm not a machine learning scientist. So I'm going to talk from the perspective of application rather than getting into the nitty gritty de details of how to do this. Other disclosures, my financial disclosures here. I am the editor of the Journal of Occupational Rehabilitation. And about a year ago, we published a special series on machine learning in work disability prevention. I'm gonna draw upon some of the articles that we published in that special series. So clinical decision-making. I've been fascinated with how therapists and doctors, nurses make decisions ever since I started practicing as a therapist, uh, probably because I found it so challenging. I uh, think about being a new graduate, you get out there and you're faced with making your own decisions about what assessment tools to use, what treatments to apply. Uh, it was daunting for me, very challenging. Very rarely were there only two pathways that I could have gone down. Most of the time, there's many options, many different uh, assessment tools, many different treatments that could be effective in a given situation. So it made me think a lot about how I was making my own decisions, how expert clinicians make decisions, and how can we improve the decisions that are made to minimize human error? Uh, you think about the decisions that are made by healthcare providers. Most of these are guided very heavily by the characteristics of the clients we work with. They may be young, they may be elderly, uh, they may have different clinical conditions, different activity limitations or challenges. Um, so by far many of the decisions are based in the knowledge that we have about the clients that we serve. Beyond that though, there's many other things that influence our clinical decisions. One is the training that we received in our professional programs, right? The papers we read, the textbooks we read, the courses we attended. This is a picture of the building that I attended as to, uh, for physical therapy school, Corbett Hall in Edmonton, Alberta. After graduation, you go out and you take clinical courses uh, you might learn new skills or new techniques that figure into your decision making. Beyond that, not only are the, the client's individual characteristics important, but their broader context comes into play. Their family context, their work context, what are their hobbies, what are the things that they like to do or need to do. Uh, all, of, all of that broader context features into our decisions. Lastly, the clinic or the hospital where we work and how we're paid basically figures into our decision making as well. It may be the case that some treatments are not paid for, so you never use those. Um, but the, the, the broader context in which we practice has a huge influence on our decision. So how do we make the best decisions? And specifically, how do we avoid making mistakes? Uh, that's really challenging. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Our decisions are influenced, like I said, by many things, but fundamentally by the knowledge that we hold and by how we put that knowledge together, the reasoning process or the logic behind it. Both of these can run into difficulty. Our knowledge may be inadequate, inappropriate, or irrelevant, completely irrelevant to a given situation. Our reasoning process or our logic may be faulty or biased. Both of these problems together can lead to less than optimal decisions. One way to overcome this is by using clinical decision support tools. What are these? Well, the definition here is any resource designed to aid directly in making therapeutic choices for patients. Most of the time these use individual patient level characteristics to generate specific recommendations. This is kind of the foundation of personalized medicine, personalized rehabilitation, basing decisions in an evidence-based manner on individual characteristics of the patients. 
Lots of times these incorporate technology or computers. So let's talk about technology for a minute. There's a quote from Daniel Suskind, the author. Technology is the worst it will ever be. Think about that for a minute. Think about that cell phone that you have in your pocket. You will never get another cell phone that is um, worse than the one that you currently have. Go back into the history of computers. 1949 was the very first computer. I really, in the grand scheme of things, was not very long ago, right? It's about 70 years ago. The electronic discrete variable automatic computer was as big as a room. It had very limited capabilities. It could do some simple additions, some calculations. Um, we've improved so much on our computer hardware. Nowadays, we have these smartphones that are super fast. They've got computer capability that would, you know, better than the computers that went to the moon, that uh, were able to fly rockets to the moon. They're faster. You've got more memory. They're even waterproof. You can drop them in the swimming pool. Software has also improved and the problem solving abilities of our computer software. So here's an image of DeepMind, the IBM computer that was able to win Jeopardy and beat two grand masters. So the, the software capabilities are so advanced. Where are we going with this? Like, where will it stop? When I was a kid, I loved watching Star Trek, that uh, old TV show, Gene Roddenberry had this glorious vision of the future that integrated technology in such a fantastic way. We had these spaceships, the USS Enterprise, it was able to explore the galaxy. And on that, the, the computers were so amazing, right? Talk about artificial intelligence, but from a medical perspective, from a healthcare perspective, they had this thing called the tricorder. There's a picture of it, right? There's Dr. McCoy using the tricorder to scan and make a diagnosis. This thing was then able to recommend treatments and actually it would go ahead and, and offer the treatment uh, to heal whatever problem the person had. Is that where we're gonna end up? I don't know. I mean, that would be pretty fantastic to have as a physical therapist, our own tricorder that would make a diagnosis make a decision and treat um, without the possibility for human error. But we're not quite there yet. We're a long ways away from that. Getting back to Daniel Suskind and his father, Richard Suskind, they, they wrote this book called The Future of the Professions. And they laid out two potential futures due to technology, neither of them being the Star Trek. Well, maybe, maybe that's number two, but they laid out one being a more efficient version of what's going on right now, but optimized and streamlined. You know, it's, we're doing the same thing, but we're doing it better. We're doing it faster and we're doing it more accurately and efficiently. That's okay, you know, that's good. But given the fantastic computing power that we have, another potential future is a complete transformation of how we work, think, and make decisions. Maybe it's the tricorder, right? But from a healthcare provider, there may be a future where we're operating, we're operating totally differently than we are now. In healthcare, we need tools that are easy to use and interpret, that are valid and reliable, ideally that are inexpensive, and that are meaningful to users, meaningful to the therapists and physicians that are using these, meaningful to the patients who are um, you know, making decisions with the healthcare provider. It's gotta be meaningful, but more importantly, these tools need to better, lead to better health and functional outcomes. They're really no good at all. If the outcomes used or obtained by using the tool are just the same as what we would get without using it. Um, so that, that should be the ultimate goal of any kind of application of machine learning or artificial intelligence or any new technology. Uh, they, they need to lead to better health and functional outcomes. So what about artificial intelligence and machine learning? Where are we going and how are we going to get there? What has been done and what could be done? This is where I believe this potential future of a complete transformation in healthcare and rehabilitation could come to fruition. 
This is a general model of computer decision support systems. This is basically how it would work if we had a tricorder, uh, you know, or take clinical signs, symptoms, imaging results, et cetera, feed them into this computer support system. Within that computer support system, there's both a knowledge base, the facts, the knowledge, and there's an inference mechanism for putting together the knowledge. After the signs and symptoms are fed into it, they're processed, a diagnostic, prognostic, or therapeutic recommendation is provided. What I'm gonna talk about for the next, uh, for the rest of my talk is this inference mechanism and how machine learning can be used to generate these. Machine learning, that's a term you hear a lot about uh, these days when you type it into PubMed or Medline, uh, you get 70,000 results as of October 1st. First time machine learning was mentioned was 1957 after the development of those early computers. And you see, there wasn't a lot that happened up until about 2011 when there was 1,000 articles, 1,139 articles published either related to or using machine learning. After that, and I really believe that's when our computer hardware and software got to the point where machine learning was really practical and easy to do. You saw a very rapid explosion of research using machine learning. And I suspect that this is going to grow, continue growing. Here's machine learning and rehabilitation. A little bit later, start date of 1979, for the first time machine learning was used in a rehabilitation publication. But you see the same sort of pattern it was around 2011 when it really started to take off. What has machine learning been studied? Uh, how has it been used in rehabilitation? Well, it's been used uh, in home care clients to guide rehabilitation planning. It's been used in low back rehabilitation to select treatments. It's been used in stroke, both in predicting outcome and in selecting treatments. It's been used in uh, assessment of imbalance and vestibular dysfunction for virtual reality rehab systems. It's been used in occupational rehabilitation for improving functional capacity evaluation. Uh, it's been used to predict rehabilitation outcomes in post-acute hip fracture patients. So you can see it's neurological, musculoskeletal, occupational rehabilitation, hospital-based care, you name it. It's, uh, we've seen a very widespread application of machine learning within rehabilitation. I mentioned this special series in the area of work disability prevention. I got together to write an introduction to this special series with a couple of machine learning scientists, Colin and Osmer, and a couple of bio, more traditional biostatisticians, Yvonne and Frank Harrow. Um, we thought that it was very important to kind of create a stable foundation for everyone of what machine learning is. We provided definitions of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, big data, all, all these kind of buzzwords that you hear nowadays in the media and in scientific papers. Um, and then we compared machine learning to traditional statistics. How are they similar? How are they different? Um, is machine learning truly better than statistics or is it just different? So I'm gonna present some of the definitions and, and some of what we wrote related to the comparison of machine learning with statistics. Here's our definition for artificial intelligence. This is a, a discipline striving to get machines to perform tasks that would normally require human or even superhuman cognitive abilities. Um, the tool that allows us to do what we cannot do or perform tasks more efficiently. And I would say that sometimes this involves programming a computer or a robot to be able to do something. Uh, there was a video, a viral video that went around about a month ago that showed a couple of robots that were able to move very carefully and kind of do parkour, jumping around a laboratory. They were programmed, right? So that is a form of artificial intelligence doing a task, um, a superhuman task. This is different from machine learning in that machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, but it's an algorithmic way to learn from data 
to solve a task without programming the computer for that task. So sometimes AI involves programming. With machine learning, there is no programming other than running data through a machine learning algorithm to come up with a model or a classification or prediction model. It often does involve classification, other times prediction. But the big difference here is that the computer is learning on its own from available data. This is kind of in a nutshell, how I envision machine learning working. So you always need a training set. You need a training set that's been labeled. So these would be the characteristics of patients uh, along with either their accurate diagnosis or a successful treatment. Um, but you've got all this data, typically thousands and thousands of cases, and they're labeled. We then run a machine learning learner or algorithm through the data, learning from it. We come up with a classification model. In this case, it's kind of represented by a gray cloud. This may be a series of rules, if then rules. It may be a decision tree, maybe a probabilistic equation, a hyperplane that's separating data into two, sometimes linear vector models do this as well. Or it might be a neural network, a lot of different varieties there, but basically it's a classification model built on the data. This classification model is then used on new unlabeled data to label it. Uh, and there's some validity checks to see if it was done properly. And you can kind of look at the accuracy of the classification model through this process. So that's machine learning in a nutshell. So there's many different machine learning techniques. I name quite a few of them here. I'll come back to deep learning in a minute, but there's many others. All of these have advantages and disadvantages. Um, they might be applicable in one situation, but not another. Um, and they might be good for one purpose or another. Uh, but again, like I said at the very beginning of my talk, I'm not a machine learning scientist, so I can't and I won't begin into a lot of detail about these different techniques. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the application of them in more general, in more general terms. I did want to talk a little bit about the difference between machine learning and traditional statistics. In machine learning, the computer is learning from the data, whereas in traditional statistics, you're modeling the data, trying to simplify complex data into a more simple mathematical model. Um, machine learning emphasizes either classification or prediction, whereas traditional statistics emphasizes probabilistic thinking, understanding uncertainty, or explaining variation. You think about a regression model and trying to come up with a certain amount of explained variation. Machine learning uses way bigger sample sizes. So you need thousands of cases, whereas traditional statistics, most of the time you're in the hundreds, far lower sample sizes required. And one benefit of machine learning is there's fewer assumptions. Basically, there's a straightforward classification that's going on. In traditional statistics, quite often there are more assumptions, assumptions of linearity or independence, so on. So you're you kind of, you need to know your data and how it was collected. And you need to know that these assumptions are held before you can be comfortable that your traditional statistics are accurate. Really importantly though, is this black box problem. Always within traditional statistics, you get a model that's interpreted. You never have a black box problem. Whereas in machine learning, sometimes there's algorithms that you can't peer into. Let me show you what I mean here. So you have a, here's an interpretable classification model. You have a training set with labeled, you run your learner. Every now and again, you'll get some model that's very, very accurate and able to classify very well, but you can't peer inside. You can't, you don't know exactly what's going on. This is a black box problem. Ideally, you would have a training set you run your learner, your learner, in this case, it's Ripper. That's one that we've used in our research, repeated incremental pruning to produce error reduction. Um, 
Ripper is nice because it presents a transparent model, if then rules that we as clinicians can look into in more detail and kind of tear apart, tease apart to see if they make clinical sense. Some of the other learners like deep learning, this I mentioned is one of the problems with some of the deep learners. They just present a black box that classifies or it fulfills its function very well, but we don't know why. We can't get under the hood. So let's talk about deep learning. It's a subclass of machine learning that uses multiple layers of nonlinearity for classification, prediction, et cetera. It disentangles the underlying factors that explain the data. And quite often it leads to significantly better performance than traditional machine learning algorithms. The way that I view it, uh, you've got machine, or you've got artificial intelligence. That's like the big field, trying to get computers to perform superhuman feats, tasks, or problem solving uh, activities. Within this broad field of artificial intelligence, you've got a subset of machine learning. Here, the computers are able to learn on their own from data. Within machine learning, you've got a subset of deep learning. Um, so it's kind of a nested doll with deep learning in the middle. I wanted to talk about some of our experience applying machine learning to rehabilitation uh, research problems. This was a paper that we wrote published in 2013, development of a computer-based clinical decision support tool for selecting appropriate rehab interventions for workers. Uh, in the field of occupational rehabilitation, I, I think of like all rehabilitation, there's a variety of treatments or programs that could be used on individual clients. They're all effective and there's evidence that they work modestly, but we don't often know what's going to be best for an individual person, for an individual worker. We have things like workplace-based interventions. We've got in-clinic functional restoration. We've got complex multidisciplinary chronic pain programs. All of these things could be effective in a given situation, but we don't always know when to use what. This is the problem that we tried to tackle using machine learning. We developed something that we called the work assessment triage tool, the WAT. It's a web-based tool for selecting rehabilitation programs for injured workers. As I said, developed using machine learning. We found that in the early studies, it was really highly accurate for picking successful interventions. And in fact, it was better than the humans doing the same task. This is a picture of it. Basically, we have a series of items with drop down menus, questions that the clinician would answer. Things like, does the worker have a job to go back to? Yes, no. What's their occupational category? Are they currently working? And so on. Fill out all of these using the drop down menus. You hit predict, and the tool gives you a series of recommendations. You'll have positive rules of things that you should consider in this situation, whatever the characteristics of the worker were. It says you should consider a hybrid program. That's a combination of functional restoration with integrated workplace. Um, this is telling you that it's most likely going to uh, allow return to work within 28 days. And the tool has a 98% level of confidence that this is going to work. Worksite-based program also might work in a shorter period of time, a little bit less confidence. Provider-based functional restoration program may also work, 22 days. Lower confidence, it's only about 82% confidence. So one thing that I liked about this tool was that it didn't make decisions for the clinicians. It provided a series of potential options and a level of confidence in each of them. It also gave uh, recommendations of treatments to avoid. So with this given situation, you do not want to uh, refer for a, com a chronic pain management program. Stay away from that. How did we make this? Well, basically, we had data on about 8,600 workers. We had information on 150 potential predictor variables, lots of demographic, clinical, occupational, um, 
self-report questionnaires, lots of characteristics of the individual workers. We knew the treatment that was recommended by the clinicians that were doing the work assessment. We knew the treatment programs that actually were undertaken and we knew the outcomes, whether these programs led to a successful return to work or not. This was our data set. We, read, we ran all of this information through our machine learning algorithm, the Ripper model, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Results showed very high accuracy of classification, both for the humans and for the machine learning algorithm. Humans were about 86% accurate. The machine learning algorithm was better, slightly better than the humans at 94% accurate. The algorithm included 19 factors with 82 rules, some positive, some negative. So we were really excited about this, right? We, we had this tool. It was just as good, if not a little bit better than the decisions the human clinicians were making. Um, we were really excited. We looked at the actual rules and we ran this by some focus groups of clinicians. Uh, I'll show you some of the rules here. So three different treatments. One is a workplace-based intervention, getting out and looking for modified duties that might be suitable. Uh, an in-clinic functional restoration program or a complex multidisciplinary chronic pain program, right? Those are three of the effective, potentially effective treatments. Here's some of the rules. So the Watt is saying that if the worker is employed, but there's no modified work yet available, they're having significant problems on the pain disability index occupation item, seven or eight out of 10. And you know, they're reporting limited most of the time on the SF36 moderate activities item. Then you need to think about workplace-based intervention. See if there is any modified duty that would be suitable. Another rule, if the individual is, is employed, modified work is available. They work in a trade occupation. Their injury duration is between 197 and 404 days. And they report being limited most of the time on the SF36 work activity. Then they are probably going to need functional restoration. Um, the modified work has not been found to be all that's needed. You need to improve their functional abilities through, through rehabilitation. Uh, that makes sense. That's one of the rules in the why. Lastly, if the worker is not employed, they don't have a job to go back to, and they report on the SF36 bathing item, showering and bathing, that they're limited all or most of the time, there's kind of a warning sign. And this individual needs to be referred for a complex multidisciplinary chronic pain program. These make sense. And the clinicians that we showed these to, you know, they kind of verified it. They put their stamp of approval on it. We were quite excited. Still cautious, though. We thought that there was a little bit more research that should be done before we recommended widespread use. So we tested the Watt in a newer data set. And lo and behold, we found lower accuracy than in our initial study. And really importantly, we found that in this external validation study, the Watt was less accurate than humans making the same decisions. That was fairly disappointing to our research group. And we spent a lot of time thinking about how we could overcome these problems, how to improve external validity. One of the things that we thought was that maybe we really need the best of both worlds. Maybe it's not enough just to run a machine learning algorithm on all this data, but we should do that and have input from the expert clinicians and add rules to the machine learning algorithm uh, based on what the clinicians were recommending. We also thought that one big limitation was that the data for both the training and the validation were drawn at different points in time separated by about four years. It would have been way better if we had continuous data that we were able to monitor that data and update our algorithms very frequently. Ideally, we would have been able to build our learning system directly into the healthcare data collection system so that the machine learning algorithm is constantly learning and being updated as new data comes in. 
Uh, we're a long ways away from that with our, in our system, but I think it is possible. Ultimately though, even if our external validity study had been shown effective and the watt was still looking very accurate, we would have wanted to go out and test it in a randomized controlled trial. Like I said, we really want a high level of confidence that these tools lead to better clinical outcomes than when the tool is not used. And the only way to really know that is through a randomized controlled trial. So that's been our experience. Wanted to talk a little bit about the smart work injury management system that Andy Chang and colleagues have developed in Hong Kong. This again is an artificial intelligence system used in work disability management, similar to our Watt. Uh, I think that Andy and his group are doing some really interesting things that are improving on some of the problems that we found um, and the challenges that we faced with the Watt. For one thing, they've got way more data. They've built the SWIM using 90,000 cases from 68 insurance companies. They had a wide variety of data, data available to them, both, uh, both on the the individual worker, um, the case manager opinion and assessment, the different treatments that were used and the results of those treatments. They had final outcomes as well, long-term outcomes. All of this was in the training set and they were able to feed that into their machine learning system. Also really importantly, they considered human factors in the return to work process. So expert, clinician opinions, uh, the opinions of the, of the workers themselves, the case managers, all these things are super important and kind of are represented here just with human factors. But I think that contextual information and that expert knowledge is really important and is being fed into this machine learning process. The outputs of the SWIM, they're looking at predicting return to work trajectories. They're looking at predicting permanent disability incurred cost of the claim overall, um, final outcomes. And, and ideally, the SWIM hopefully will be able to provide advice on medical care and return to work interventions that rehabilitation clinicians can use to change the negative outcomes when the prediction is for, you know, things are not looking that great. So far, the SWIM has been looking good. In the early stages, again, they're kind of in this development and training stage and internal validation. They found that the disability prediction, prediction of disability level is about 70% accurate and prediction of the number of days of sick leave is about 60% accurate, which is great. And both of these are outperforming the human estimations. This is looking a lot like the Watt in the early days. Um, their research is outgoing, I'm hoping uh, that because they are overcoming some of the limitations that we faced with the Watt, that the next stage of the research and their external validation is going to look better, and that this will be a tool that can be applied widely to improve the clinical outcomes. Wanted to say just a little bit about ethical considerations. This is really important and something that we don't, it's probably not thought about as much as it should be. We really wanted a paper on this in our special series in Journal of Auk Rehab. Uh, Marianne Sixtextra, a PhD student in the Netherlands, has given a lot of thought and, and wrote this paper. Um, I refer you to this uh, for, for more detail, but I wanted to highlight one thing that is really, really important. That is the high level of surveillance that goes into collecting the data to build machine learning algorithms. As I said, you really need thousands and thousands of data points. In order to get that, uh, one of the easiest way in healthcare settings is to go into an insurance company data set or a hospital data set and do a, like a, a data dump. Quite often the patients uh, don't know that this is being done. They will not have given consent. Um, so there are some ethical implications here. And the research that's being done, I mean, our research on injured workers was reviewed by an ethics board. We obtained a waiver of consent. It was all retrospective data. 
And there was a lot of stipulations placed on our use of the data. We had to keep it confidential. We had to keep it contained um, and stored on a, on a password protected and encrypted computer uh, at my university. Um, basically, we had to be very cautious to protect the confidentiality of the individual workers that are in the data set. So, so that's important and um, a critical thing to think about as machine learning and the tools that come out of machine learning applications are used more and more in healthcare settings. Wanted to uh, end by talking about some work that an engineering colleague of mine is doing in a different type of machine learning and rehabilitation robotics. So in this situation, it's not so much about learning a classification or prediction algorithm. This is training a robot to learn actions or interventions, treatments that are demonstrated by a therapist. So it's learning from demonstration. It's challenging to explain in words. So I'm gonna show you a video. We wrote this up in a, a paper called Intelligent Robotics, Incorporating Machine Learning Algorithms for FCE and ARC Rehab. But let me show you, let me show you a video. This video is showing a therapist taught robotic system for assistance during gait therapy, targeting foot drop. So this is the experimental uh, setup. You've got two grad students, one acting as a therapist, one acting as a patient with foot drop. The therapist is interacting with a robot which as you can see is connected to the patient's leg, elevating it up to uh, achieve clearance as the individual steps through during their gait pattern. Uh, the therapist is helping the robot learn exactly how much force is required to clear the toe. The computer is learning very precisely the actions and the amount of force required. And then after training, the robot is able to reproduce the therapist assistance using the machine learning model, allowing the patient to practice independently without the therapist be there, being there. And this robot can now um, provide more or less uh, assistance depending on the needs of the patient. This is a very experimental setting, and it's not, um, not available for widespread use, not being used in, in uh, hospitals. But you can see how these learning robots could have lots of applications in a lot of different areas of rehabilitation. The combination of being able to very precisely measure the amount of um, force or movement that a patient is able to generate combined with the very precise measurement of the amount of force required to help them perform a functional activity uh, is really useful. We've experimented more in the area of occupational rehab, simulating work activities, things like painting, simulated painting, simulated sweeping, shoveling, lifting, carrying. Um, it's been really interesting. I mean, what we had envisioned was an entire inventory of simulated functional activities that someone may have to do at work, especially high risk work settings. Um, and we think that there's applications both for assessment from the work assessment or ability perspective, as well as training, functional retraining, motor retraining. Um, it's very, very exciting. I don't know where this is going to end up. Right now though, it is very exploratory, not ready for widespread use. We are still a long ways away from the Star Trek tricorder. You know, we're taking steps, baby steps towards it, but we're a long ways away from that. Wanted to summarize, you know, I wanted to be a little bit visionary with this talk and really give you a good foundation for machine learning, what it is, what's been done with it, and show you the huge potential that it has for rehabilitation and helping to inform decisions made by human therapists. Huge potential to help overcome human error, minimize those mistakes that we make. Um, but 
need to temper that enthusiasm with a little bit of reality because these tools, even though they're rapidly developing, they're still exploratory, right? And one of the huge problems is they're great at learning from one particular data set, but then extrapolating that to new data has been a problem. It's been uh, yeah, really problematic and the models don't always hold up in the external validity steps or stages. Um, although I think with better integration of the data systems and the health systems, we might overcome a lot of those problems. And it's going to be really interesting to see in the next five years um, what sort of tools are developed and what the validity of the existing tools looks like. I'm thinking that within the next 10 to 15 years, we will have some really great and useful machine learning tools that help with data informed decisions that can help move rehabilitation from kind of a trial and error decision-making process to truly personalized rehabilitation where the individual characteristics of our clients, the broader contextual settings of you know, their family characteristics, where they work, um, you know, broader settings are kind of brought into play as well. And all these factors are used to inform better more evidence-based decisions. Wanted to end by acknowledging my collaborators as well as some of the uh, funders and clinical groups that have helped provide data for the research. Uh, this is really an international effort and there's people around the world that are using machine learning that are both developing the machine lear learning algorithms themselves as well as finding better ways to apply and test those algorithms within healthcare and rehabilitation settings. At the University of Alberta, I've benefited really greatly from Osmer Zayan, who's the director of the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. Uh, Colin Belanger is a postdoctoral student with him who's moved on to bigger and better things. Um, they are the two machine learning scientists that have really informed my thinking and helped out with, uh, with my own research. Also worked with engineers and other clin uh, rehabilitation scientists. Lastly, I wanted to recognize the important role of graduate students all the way through from masters, PhD to postdoctoral fellows who have helped and worked on these uh, projects um, and have really been the, the workhorses to uh, get a lot of the, the projects accomplished. So thank you very much. Thanks for listening. And I look forward to our conversation. And I hope that you have a great rest of your conference. Thank you very much.